So, for example, why is the following true? But in fact, let's actually try and tackle an easier problem to begin with. Let's ask why is the following true? And this thing right here, even at face value, it already looks pretty good. It looks acceptable. And I think that's because we sort of have a feel for this in real life. And what I mean is, well, you can take this negative 2 to stand for owing somebody $2. Now we times this by 3, so you triple your owing. Now you owe that person $6, represented by that minus 6. So we take this one to be we take this to be true based on our intuitions. We set that as a definition. So now let's go back to our original problem. Now I want you to imagine you're the very first person to actually ever consider this product. You're the person that's designing our number system. And it really is literally up to you to decide what this product should give us. So it's whatever you choose it to be. So you can go for some silly answers. You could choose this to be 1 million. Um, cats. Silly answers. But you have to agree, if you want a working number system, one that makes sense and is actually useful, you really only got two options. Either this is minus 6, or option 2, you get positive 6. So we narrowed it down to two choices. So we have to find out which one is the correct one. Well, let's take option 1 for now. Suppose you take option 1. Now, I want you to compare this with what we decided before. Once you do this, you realize there's something wrong with option 1. That is, you take a specific number, in this case, negative 2, and you multiply it by two very different numbers. In this case, negative 3 and positive 3. And yet, we get the exact same result, minus 6. And that's something we don't like. You know, we expect it so that when we multiply by negative 3 and positive 3, we expect it to get different answers. So based on that, this is not the correct choice. And therefore, this one must be the correct one, based on elimination. On to our next problem. Why is it that we can't divide by 0? So, you've been playing around with fractions for a while. You can divide by positive numbers, you can divide by negative numbers, everything checks out, everything's fine. However, you can begin to consider this thing, 1 divided by 0. And what should this thing be? Well, right now we don't have a definition for what this thing is. But suppose we do, suppose we have a definition, and I'm going to symbolize that definition with the letter X, whatever it may be. where a is some number. Okay, so let's try and examine this definition through different cases. Case 1. a is not 0. So in this case here, if we multiply both sides of the equation by 0, so the definition, we multiply both sides by 0, we get this thing here. So immediately we can see a problem, that is, if we take 0 and times it by something, we don't get 0 back, a itself is not 0. So in this case here, 0 sort of has lost its meaning, 0 doesn't behave the way we want it to anymore. Okay, what about case 2? A itself is 0. So in this case, we have x is 0 on 0. Now, the problem with this thing here is, well, 
one certainly satisfies this thing. So, so does five. And so does everything else. So the problem with this thing here is the definition in this case doesn't give us anything specific. So it's not very useful. So overall, we can see that it's not impossible to define what it means to divide by zero, but it's just that once you do, you destroy the number zero itself. And the number itself is obviously a lot more important than dividing by zero, so we leave it undefined. Okay, next question. What is zero factorial? Well, in general, we know that n factorial can be written as n times n minus 1 factorial. So, for example, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial. And we obviously know that 1 factorial is just 1. So, we're going to use these tools as a bridge towards 0 factorial. Well, if this is true, then whatever 0 factorial may be, it must satisfy this thing. And this is 1, and this is 1. And so this forces 0 factorial to be 1. And that's it. But we can do better. There's one more thing we can do. And that is, we can make the conclusion that we can't define negative factorial. So for example, what does this mean? Minus 1 factorial. Well, whatever it may be, it must satisfy this thing. And now we know that this is 1. This is 0 times minus 1 factorial. And so, negative 1 factorial, the reason why we can't define it is because it's equivalent to defining dividing by 0. So what exactly is the radian measure? And I'll begin with the familiar diagram. That is, the amount of angle in a straight line angle is 180 degrees. Now, the thing to realize is, there's nothing special about the number 180. It's just a convention, an arbitrary one. So, what I mean is, we could have just chosen to use the number 60 to represent the amount of angle in a straight line. So in this case, our right angle wouldn't be represented with 90 degrees. In this case, it would be 30 degrees. So the idea is, you can use any number you wish to use to represent angles, as long as we all agree on the convention, then everything will run smoothly. The only reason we probably chose to use 180 de um, degrees to represent the straight line it's probably because the number 180 has lots of factors. So many common angles have integer value representations. For example, um, 180 divided by 2 is 90. Um, divided by 3 is 60. Um, divided by 4 is 45. And so on. So, Many common angles have nice integer value representations. So, what number we use to represent angles is up to us. It's up to us to choose. So, to get to the idea of radians, we're going to do a funny thing. We're going to choose to use the number pi to represent the amount of angle in a straight line. And this is a choice. And it's a bit of an odd choice because, well, pi certainly doesn't have the advantages of 180. It doesn't have nice factors. It's not even rational. So, in fact, all the angles have this awkward numerical value that doesn't even terminate. And so on. So, why do we choose to use pi for our angle measure? Well, I think one reason is Let's consider the area of a circle. So, area of a sector actually. So, 
So let's consider an area of a sector that attains an angle of theta degrees with respect to the Fourier evolution. Well, the fraction that the unknown area for the sector with respect to the area of the whole circle should be exactly the same as the fraction in which the angle makes with, with respect to the whole revolution. So, taking the pi r squared moving into the other side, we get the area is theta degrees over 360 degrees times pi r squared. And here's our equation for the area of the sector. Now, let's do the exact same thing, but this time we're going to use radian measures. So again, this will be true, where theta is now measured in radians. And we know that according to this convention, if a straight line angle makes pi amount of angles, then a full revolution must be 2 pi. And in this case, if I drag the pi r square to the other side, I'll get half of theta r squared. So this thing also works out the area of the, this sector here. But everything is represented with the convention of using pi to represent a straight line angle. And as you can see, this versus this, this one is obviously a lot cleaner looking. And this happens really often because pi itself is a very fundamental quantity that arises in many areas of mathematics. And this usually happens. You know, the equation sort of cleans itself if you choose to use this convention. So radians provides a way of seeing the natural form of mathematics. It's definitely a lot more viable than using the